All right, everyone, uh, welcome back. Um, our next speaker uh, is Nathan Sprang, who is the, an assistant professor at Cornell University, and he holds the auspicious title of the Rebecca Q. and James C. Morgan Sesquicentennial Faculty Fellow. And I've just confirmed that sesquicentennial means 150 years, and I guess Cornell is uh, going to be celebrating its 150th uh, anniversary of its founding very soon. Um, Nathan is one of a uh, sort of a relatively younger guard of scientists who have taken research on the default network to very interesting and important new places. He was in fact identified recently by the Association for Psychological Science as a rising star uh, for his research on autobiographical memory, imagination, future-oriented thought, uh, and important ways of analyzing functional connectivity among the different elements of the default network that Randy Buckner told us all about. And in addition, he's interested in understanding how these, uh, the default network and its functional roles change across the lifespan. So let's welcome Nathan Sprang. Thank you very much. It's, re it's really an honor to be here. Um, I feel like as um, a graduate student five years ago in the Great White North in Toronto, um, I was I didn't really exist in the academic world, and so, and I'm also now in Cornell, Ithaca, which is also sort of the Great White North, um, far away from a lot of the the thriving sort of like intellectual environment and cognitive neuroscience here in New York City, and also in the, in the Boston area. So it's really an honor to be here uh, before you today and to talk about the work that I've been doing uh, for the last few years. And in this talk, I'll be discussing the default network and its role in self-generated thought in relationship both to its component processes and the role in dynamic control. So um, there's, we've been throwing around a couple words, the default mode network, default mode, default network. And um, to my mind, really, the default network is really about the topology of the neural system. Um, throwing in the mode is kind of including the W and George W. Bush when you know what you're talking about already. Um, it's not necessary. Also, default mode suggests a, a sort of passive state um, where we're not necessarily involved in, in cognition. And what I think is critically important is to really try to delve into and understand the cognitive processes that the default network itself supports. Uh, and in particular, I believe that role is specifically in that of, of self-generated thought, which is very distinct from this notion of perceptually driven thought. Uh, that is very much bound to the sensory environment and what we're immediately perceiving from, say, our visual system. It's a, it's a, a form of thinking that is really associative and constructive and, and comes from within, and it's er internally directed, in that the information that we process isn't immediately apparent in the environment around us. So today what I'd like to discuss is um, in particular, the role of the default network in memories of our past and how we can imagine our future, and also as it relates to social cognition and think about the thoughts and feelings of those around us. For the second half of the talk, I will discuss um, the role of the default network and its interactions with the rest of the brain. Um, the system is not isolated and has um, very dynamic relationships with, with a number of systems, um, including its relationship to executive control and cognitive control as well as some work I've been doing more recently on methodological developments and some of the new insights that we might glean on the role of the default network. And hopefully, maybe have some, some thoughts on aesthetics and creativity. It was really kind of why many of you are here today. Um, hopefully, what I show you will at least some self-evident uh, relationships, but we'll, I'll try to make some connections and move beyond the data and to speak more broadly. So as, as many of you now know, we came to recognize the default network by virtue of its deactivation during externally oriented tasks. It's only been more recently where we've come to appreciate the active role this network plays in cognition. So what's depicted here is some work that was done by Donna Addis and Dan Schachter where they had individual subjects recollecting events from their past. This is a first person uh, reminiscence where you can travel back in time and re-experience something that happened at an earlier date. Likewise, they had subjects imagining a novel event in their future. Now, these processes are driving both the, the posterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, as well as the hippocampus. Now, the same year that this study came out, there was a very interesting um, 
neuropsychological case, uh, uh, case series uh, that Demis Hassabis reported with Eleanor McGuire, whereby individuals who had medial temporal lobe damage and were unable to recollect events from their past also had this co-occurring deficit in that they could not imagine uh, events in the future. They could not construct a scene in their mind's eye and have an event unfold. Now this relationship between remembering and imagining the future was one that was actually put forward by Endel Tolving nearly 30 years ago, where um, he reported um, in a small paper in Canadian Psychology, that a single case study of KC, where in discussions with them, this amnesiac who could not recollect anything from his past, asked him if he could think about the future, and, and this amnesiac was unable to, and, and Dr. Tolvin pressed him a little bit and said, what is it that you think about when I ask you to think about the future? And this amnesiac said, it's like being led into a room and told to sit down in a chair, and there's nothing there, there's nowhere to sit. And this patient, and many patients like them, are really this island in time. They're only living in the present moment. They don't have a past by which to root their experiences, and they also are unable to prospect and envisage a time other than the now. And Endel Tolvin referred to this as a kind of self-knowing consciousness. And it's really from this angle that I began to think about the default network. And there, there is substantial amount of evidence to suggest that the human brain is organized into these two dynamic anti-correlated systems. One of them, depicted here in gold, is referred to as a dorsal attention network, which is, um, this is partly what, what Randy touched on, um, areas that are involved in attending to the external world. And the, this network is in competition and dynamically opposed to the default network, depicted here in green, which seems to be supporting more of this internalized mode of cognition. And when activation in the attention network goes up, activity in the default network goes down in this dynamic competition where we seem to be toggling between attending to the external world um, or our own thoughts and feelings. And actually, I'm very grateful for, for Randy's talk and how interesting and compelling it was as I was unable to actually ruminate on my own talk that was coming afterwards. <laughs> and, and very kindly, Randy also uh, walked you th through this slide. Um, this, this paper that came out in 2007 was really sort of revolutionary in terms of my own thinking about the brain um, and actually fundamentally changed one of my very good friendships. So I've been very interested in the link between recollection and imagining. And, we, and what you can see here is just this representation of an individual in the here and now, and they're capable of recollection, um, remembering this, this previous picnic or imagining the cleanup. And I've been very focused in my graduate studies on understanding the neural link between these two processes. My good friend Raymond Marr, also a graduate student, um, at the time was studying social cognition and its relationship to narrative fiction. And we had known each other for six years and had, <coughs> were very good friends, um, but we actually saw no connection between our research interests whatsoever until this paper came out. And I remember receiving um, the corrected proofs of this and I immediately emailed it to Raymond and he called me a couple hours later and said like, it looks like our research interests are much more aligned than we had thought. Like we really should look into this with much more depth and really try to understand if there is a true empirical basis for suggesting that there is a common neural system not just underlying our ability to recollect and imagine, but also for us to transport ourselves into the minds of others and to mentalize about them and think about their thoughts and feelings. And uh, w what Randy had done was he, he postulated that all of these processes of self-projection are supported by the default network by virtue of this network's involvement in, in stimulus-independent thinking. That is thought that is not driven by the immediate environment, but that which is self-generated. So what Raymond and I and Alice Kim, who was at the time a, a research assistant for Endel Tolving, we set about to systematically search the literature of the neuroimaging studies that examine these, these cognitive domains in isolation and see if, in fact, we could find convergence. And we did so with an approach that had recently been f put forward was to examine the literature in the form of a quantitative meta-analysis. And I don't really understand why, but there was a, a very fortunate um, 
consistency in the imaging literature whereby people reported the peak foci of activation in the brain. Um, it was arrived upon very early in the emergence of neuroimaging studies, even before we really know what to do with that kind of data. But now what we're capable of doing is actually pooling these coordinates across the brain where people found peak activation um, and, and model those activation patterns and examine what the interstudy consistencies are. And then um, by permuting these data randomly, we're able to determine what are significant and reliable findings across the literature. And what we found were act essentially reliable activation maps independently across all of these cognitive domains for autobiographical memory, navigation, theory of mind, uh, the default mode, and also prospection. And in a very sort of very simple analysis, we overlaid these maps. And what we find that was indeed the case, there is a very remarkable extent of overlap across all of these cognitive domains. And consistent with what Randy had postulated is um, that these resided within the default network. So what we find is a, a convergence of activation in medial prefrontal cortex, parietal cor medial parietal cortex in the posterior cingulate, medial temporal lobes, the inferior parietal lobule, as well as aspects of um, the inferior frontal gyrus and lateral temporal cortex. All these core regions of the default network. What was most remarkable in this study was that was the extent of overlap that was really observed between autobiographical recollection and mentalizing. That, and th these lines of research had been studied in isolation for a number of years. And it was quite striking, really, the extent to which when we remember events from our life and when we think about the thoughts of others and when we infer intentionality, the great extent to which that neural real estate is really overlapping and convergent. Now, this was found to be true across independent studies where this hypothesis was not directly tested. And um, working with Shale Grady, I had the unique opportunity to actually pursue this study directly and to examine if, if the same brain is performing these different tasks, will we also show a convergence of activity? So in order to examine this, what we did is we showed our subjects a photograph, and then we asked them to remember something related to that image, imagine a time in the future that might relate to that image, or to think about the thoughts and feelings of a target in that photograph. And they did this uh, for a period of approximately 20 seconds, and then rated how clearly they were able to formulate this event in their mind's eye. In an analysis of this brain activity, what we found relative to a somatosensory control condition was in fact a great de degree of convergence between these three modes of thinking. Um, and those areas are depicted here in gold. And what you see is that there's robust involvement across um, remembering and imagining the thoughts and feelings of others in lateral temporal cortex, inferior parietal lobule, inferior frontal uh, gyrus, as well as uh, the precuneus, uh, posterior cingulate region, and aspects of medial prefrontal cortex. There is, um, interestingly, and I've been thinking a lot more about this, like not much convergence here in the most anterior regions. I'll touch on that a little bit later. However, there is also a significant pattern of um, activity in these data which significantly dissociated theory of mind from autobiographical memory and prospection. So the areas depicted in gold have um, more specific increases in activity related to thinking about the thoughts and feelings of others. These are in the superior temporal sulcus as well as the right temporal parietal junction. These regions are really core regions for thinking about other people, thinking about uh, the beliefs of others as well as inferring um, information um, from like biological motion. The areas in blue are significantly more engaged for remembering and imagining one's personal future. And here we're seeing substantial and robust engagement of retrosplenial cortex going down into the hippocampus bilaterally, as well as parts of ventral prefrontal cortex. So what these findings suggest is that indeed there is a common core network that's engaged for all of these modes of, of stimulus independent thought. Um, however, there are also specific subregions that are preferentially engaged uh, between social cognition and that of recollection and imagining oneself. These results um, dovetail very nicely with work that um, Jess Andrews Hanna did um, as a graduate student with Randy Buckner, 
looking at numerous modes of, um, of self-relevant thinking, self-generated thoughts related to the present and also the future relative to a control condition, <laughs> as well as patterns of resting state functional connectivity. And, and what they found and concluded was really there seemed to be within the default network two core regions in posterior cingulate and anterior medial prefrontal cortex, as well as two distinct subsystems. The one subsystem seems to be more specific to mentalizing and forms of social cognition. And this is referred to as the dorsomedial subsystem, and it includes the right temporal parietal junction, um, parts of lateral temporal cortex, the anterior temporal poles, as well as more dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. And these regions are all more tightly connected with each other as well as the two core hub regions. However, are less connected with this other subsystem, which is the medial temporal lobe subsystem that involves primarily the hippocampal formation and the medial temporal lobes and retrosplenial cortex. While these areas are all densely interconnected and activated together, um, they're also connected tightly to these core hubs. They are less connected to this other <coughs> subsystem. I'm just going to walk through a couple studies that I think very nicely sort of exemplify some of the functions of these two subsystems as, however, are working within more broadly the functions of the default network. The first study was conducted by Demis Hassabis um, looking at what he referred to as scene construction. His idea was that, um, first of all, this is the same individual who found that hippocampal amnesics had an inability to also imagine future events. So he's interested in looking at brain-wide what regions are involved in the construction of a scene in the mind's eye. And this is very specific to simulating that, that spatial environment, which they seem to believe was critical um, and also converges well with the findings of navigating and what Randy talked about. Imagine how you could, from memory, how you would actually exit this room, this process of formulating the spatial environment in the mind's eye. And what Demis did was he had individuals um, close their eyes and, and imagine um, maybe lay, laying on the sandy beach in a tropical bay. Um, they would be given this cue, they would close their eyes, and they would envisage this environment. Um, and, and this was scanned. And then they rated essentially how, how difficult this, this process was. Now relative to imagining objects, what they found was robust involvement of retrosplenal cortex, the hippocampus bilaterally, as well as parts of the inferior parietal lobule. Like very consistent with what we now appreciate to be part of this uh, medial temporal lobe subsystem that's involved in mnemonic spatial processes of imagining an event. In the last years I was, um, in the last year I was in Dan Schachter's lab as a postdoc, uh, I had the opportunity to to work with Demis, who was also doing an international postdoc. And we had a number of conversations and debates about the nature of stimulus-independent thinking and whether or not scene construction was sufficient in order for us to have an imagination space, in order for us to rise out of the ongoing moment. And something that we, is a constant sticking point for us was, well, our memories, our memories are populated by people. It's, it's this consistent confound in the autobiographical memory research where it's not just about remembering scenes, um, but a core part of our life are other individuals. Our memories are primarily social. And what we wanted to understand were really where are the people represented in our reminiscences and how was that distinct? And actually going back to some of Demis's data, he always wondered about this pattern of activity here and was concerned that that was driven by the subjects in the imagined scenes, rather than being part of scene construction. So what we had our subjects do in order to examine the social element of simulation, um, we, we were interested in its relationship to memory, but we all have different memories. We all have different ideas of the people in our life and, and different experiences. And given the fact that imagination shares so many of the same neural bases as remembering, we try to devise a, a more um, consistent method by which to have subjects think about others. And so what we did was we constructed these individuals. We fabricated them. Um, 
based upon core personality characteristics um, from personality literature. And what we devised were these four individuals, um, Dave, Nick, Mike, and Chris, and um, for the men and the women in the study, um, imagined women, but essentially they were given a 12 statements by which to characterize this individual. So Dave, he was highly agreeable and highly extroverted. Mike, he was low on agreeableness, and this is a personality characteristic. Um, agreeableness is a tendency towards altruism, cooperation, and valuing harmony in interpersonal relationships. Now this is opposed to antisocial or exploitative behavior. So somebody who's low on agreeableness is a very unkind kind of person. Now, we also trained our subjects on, on Nick, who would be um, very highly agreeable, but low on extroversion. So I mean, you've met these people in your life, somebody who, who's very kind, but is, is introverted um, and not terribly outgoing. And then finally, um, we had Chris, who was very low on extroversion. He was very introverted and also not terribly agreeable. And what we did was we trained our subjects over the course of a couple hours on who these people were. We had them answer multiple choice questions about them, write a brief summary of what their basic personality traits were like. And so they were able to form a representation of these four individuals. And then we had our subjects imagine these individuals in a number of different scenes. So to give you an example of what these scenes were, um, we would have all of the scenes were actually pre-imagined. Prior to going into the scanner, they, they imagined a street, a, a restaurant, a park, a bank, an office, standing by a statue. And in the scanner, we presented them with the beginning of a vignette. So in this imagination condition, they were expected to recall what that street was that they had constructed before going into the scanner. And the vignette is, you see a homeless vet asking for change. And then Chris. What happens next? How does this event unfold in the mind's eye? So you can imagine um, what Chris does, who is very low on agreeableness um, and, and low on extroversion. He'll have a very different kind of response to a person asking for change than, say, Dave, who, who's very agreeable and very extroverted. The nature of that interaction will be very different. We also um, had a control condition where, um, this is one of the vignettes as well, in a bar, somebody spills their drink. Again, you can imagine somebody who is highly extroverted, but also low on agreeableness, um, is more likely to pick a fight than somebody who's highly agreeable, um, potentially low on, high on introversion. So in a control condition, however, we'd say, um, just imagine this empty scene. So sort of disregard the vignette but just construct that scene, an empty bar in your mind's eye. So we have these, these two conditions um, where we have a social simulation, where we have these individuals with a fairly robust representation um, and this social event unfolding versus con just constructing what this environment looks like in the mind's eye. And finally, we had another condition where subjects simply counted the syllables in the statement before them. So relative to the lowest level contrast, um, the simulation versus counting, what we see is that when imagining this social situation unfolding, as well as just imagining this empty scene, you see fairly robust engagement of the default network relative to this counting condition. We see these same posterior cingulate regions, medial prefrontal cortex, inferior parietal lobule, inferior frontal gyrus, lateral temporal areas. Um, and it, it's more robust for the social um, than it is for the empty scene. But you see a similar pattern across this default network. What we're very interested in is what is specific to the social over and above just imagining the spatial temporal environment. And this is what we find. There is very specific activation in the anterior temporal lobes bilaterally, as well as um, regions in dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. In addition to some increased activity in ventromedial and posterior cingulate and also visual regions. But really, we think um, the most robust responses were really driven by this dorsal medial area and the anterior temporal lobes, which were, again, as I mentioned before, part of this uh, dorsal medial subsystem of the default network. But further, and that's for imagining all of these individuals. However, they were quite distinct um, in terms of their personality. And in fact, in looking at the magnitude of bold signal response, we don't see differences in the brain, at least not in the 20 subjects that we scanned. 
So what we took was um, a machine learning approach to look at whether or not there were patterns of activation within the brain that predicted whom our subjects were thinking about. And we searched the entire brain for areas that carried information about specific individuals. And what we found, there was one part of the brain, and that's in this dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, where we could, we could predict who our subject was thinking about simply based upon the neural activity in that region, the patterns of neural activity in this region of the brain. If we take this area and we look at where, what this region is correlated with during this imagination episode, what we find is that it's, the activity here is correlated with the full extended default network, such that this person information is, is the representation of these individual people, that activity is correlated with this full default network involving not just the dorsal medial uh, prefrontal subsystem, but also core areas. And because these individuals are also imagining in a scene, we are seeing as well um, retrospinal cortex activity in the medial temporal lobes. So that this, the entire system is tuned and involved in the process of simulating an event. Um, but it's, it's really this, this dorsal medial region that, that's more specific to the identity of other individuals. And as I mentioned, this, this fits in well with this evolving view of the default network not acting as a unitary entity but really has specific sub-roles in the, this, the richness of the cognitive experience of simulation or, or remembering. And this fits in really nicely with some of the work that um, has emerged from Randy Buckner's lab, looking to parcelate the cortex into these large-scale neural systems. What Randy showed you earlier was the default network sort of as a whole. But here what we see, if we break down the networks, not just from seven large-scale systems, but into 17 parcellations, we see these subsystems emerge. And again, we have core regions in posterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, as well as um, another subsystem that's consistent with this dorsal medial prefrontal and the, the medial temporal lobes. Now, there have been, since I conducted my initial meta-analysis in 2009, there have been some very dramatic sort of big data approaches to meta-analysis of the brain mapping literature, and um, with, the, with the assistance of Tal Yarconi, we were able to take these resting state parcellation schemes and go back and scan hundreds of papers and do a big sort of dumb meta-analysis where we're able to just grab the words that are most represented in the papers that are co-varying with activity in these subregions. And this is what we find. This is across thousands of imaging studies far more than we could actually read in the course of a few months of conducting a meta-analysis. What we find is a very interesting consistency here where we have our dorsal medial subsystem. This is an area that we're seeing in social cognition, um, mental inference. W the words in the literature when people are talking about activity here are mentalizing, person, social, <coughs> mental, scenarios, knowledge, theory of mind, meaning. But interestingly, there's also another set of words that is consistent with narrative and semantic knowledge or conceptual knowledge um, related to comprehension, story, sentences, language, word. Now, in contrast, we have our medial temporal subsystem that I've been talking about as more specific to autobiographical recollection and imagining. And here we see these same words emerging when we look at patterns of activity that are driving these regions. And finally, our, our core regions in posterior cingulate and medial prefrontal cortex more related to the concepts of self-referential and self, personal, autobiographical, person, um, as well as um, what I've touched on before is the social, the mentalizing, uh, moral cognition, positive and negative. So we can begin to just cluster in a big data kind of way the concepts that are driving activity in these regions that we, we isolated and, and found using resting state functional connectivity. So we can begin to bring meaning to the structure of um, the spontaneous oscillations in the brain. So just to give kind of an, an interim comment on this, I think at this point um, we, we've arrived upon a good delineation of the network topology. Like we seem to know where in the brain the default network is. 
um, as well as there being core regions and, um, and sub-network regions. Although um, I understand that Daniel disagrees with me um, in our discussions over dinner last night, and he might re refute this assertion. Um, however, I, I, I do think that these are fairly reliable, and, um, but in addition to this, there are dissociable cognitive processes supported by this network. And this is, this is a pretty substantial advance from where we were five years ago, where this network was really conceptualized as a task-negative network. And I think to a large degree, this is a consequence of how the network was discovered, and that was by its deactivations. Um, and I think there's been um, a bit of a fallacy in how we've characterized um, goal-directed cognition and attention-based cognition, where you know, we want experimental control, and, and the first studies that examine brain activity try to maximize experimental control by driving the subject's thoughts with visually presented information. And by that nature, they were necessarily attending to perceptual information. And this is something the default network doesn't like, and it's suppressed. However, I don't think it's specific to goal-directed cognition. I think we have our, in our lives, we have these goals that are personally meaningful, that involve other people, they involve ourselves, that involve how we think about our future. And that's another mode of goal direction that isn't as, hasn't really been addressed as much in the cognitive neuroscience literature, but I think is very much equally valid and is of great concern to how we understand ourselves and how we understand the brain. So in light of that, and uh, I, a broader question is like, how is it that with our memories and our thoughts of others, how is it that we begin, how can this default network start interacting with other systems of the brain? It can't, we can't function um, with it in isolation. We need to actually modulate our behavior and our goals in accordance with the internal demands that we have. And in order to do that, we need to appreciate how the default network extends its influence um, to other systems so it can get to motor cortex. We can actually physically initiate goals or the actions necessary to fulfill goals. So I mentioned earlier that, um, I mean, there, there seems to be this, this opposition, this diametric opposition between attending to the physical world and to the internal world. Uh, and somehow we, we need to cross this bridge between them. And one method in order to, to look at goal-directed cognition, and one that I've pursued, is, is to look at planning. How we're able to make plans in the world as kind of a, a key element to goal-directed cognition. I don't think it gets more goal-directed than that. How do we actively plan to accomplish goals? And we need to think for a moment, how has planning actually been studied? Well, Tim Shallis introduced to the neuropsychological community the Tower of London task, where individuals are, or patients with frontal lobe lesions are presented with a goal configuration on this puzzle, and also a start configuration, and the objective is to figure out the minimum number of moves it takes to um, moving one disc at a time with nothing on top in order to reach this goal state. So in this case, we would move the, um, the green disc over one, the red disc over two, the blue disc on top of the green one, and then the red back. So that would be a four move puzzle task. This is a look ahead puzzle task. And this is really a, a radical reductionist view of planning. However, it still embodies some of the core essential elements. There needs to be a recognition of the current state as well as a future state and, and searching the space of that difference and finding a sequence by which to accomplish that goal. It also happens to be in, in this very uh, visuospatial modality. And if we image this task, what we see is there's, there's pretty robust engagement of the dorsal tension network. However, we know from, from the literature and previous studies that imagining the future, like remembering the past, engages the default network. So there was really this this sort of paradox at the time is to like, how is it that we're able to bridge um, across these anti-correlated networks uh, the ability to take our own personal thoughts about the future and formulate them into a plan? So the hypothesis was that there, there could be this intervening regions, this intervening network, and some evidence uh, supported this notion that there's the anterior insula involved in switching or toggling between internal representations and external space. The anterior extent of the inferior parietal lobule is involved in the control of both memory and the control of attention. And the frontal poles have long been recognized for their role in executive control and goal-directed processes. 
And also some resting state functional connectivity work suggested that all of these regions were in fact functionally connected. Uh, this is work that Justin Vincent did with Randy Buckner, and he alluded to this network earlier, uh, that's interposed both between the default and the attention network system. So it's possible that, that, that this network actually might modulate or facilitate the, the crossing of information between default and attention systems. And in order to test this hypothesis, we need to develop a new task, a new task to assess planning, but in an autobiographical domain. So to do this, um, what we did was we conducted a number of interviews with undergraduate students to get a sense of what their real areas of concern were, what were their goals, um, and how were they going to get there, and what were some of the obstacles they need to overcome along the way. So um, what we found was that, um, and we designed this task to actually be visually uh, similar to the Tower of London condition. Our, um, our most reliable goal our undergraduates have. <laughs> and um, some ways to get there. <laughs> so what we presented for our subjects um, to sort of formalize and operationalize this procedure, in the scanner we sort of embedded these cues into the, the Tower of London apparatus. So we would present the goal state for five seconds and then these, um, these three steps. So getting a good job, um, saving money and having fun. Now, they had 15 seconds to come up with a plan. I mean, this is a brief sampling of um, how we formulate plans. You could sit with down a, a financial advisor and talk for two hours about this process. Um, what we had our undergraduates do was just try to integrate this information. So if they're thinking, okay, I want to have, get a good job, potentially as an investment banker, you can set aside 20% of your income for savings and you can use the rest to go have fun. That's the example of a, a good plan that they could make. Um, and then they rated essentially how much detail there was to their autobiographical plan. And afterwards, we conducted an extensive series of interviews, uh, really reassessing each of their autobiographical plans to ensure that they were formulated in the scanner, followed by a fixation. And then we also had our subjects um, perform the standard Tower of London planning tasks, ranging from three moves, five, um, six, and seven moves in order to solve the puzzle. In order to look at common patterns of activity, we also included a, a lower level control condition, which simply involved um, counting the vowels that were presented in random letter sequences within the disks and providing a response. All right, so when we look at the pattern of activity in the brain, um, while subjects are doing these tasks, what we find is a robust dissociation between autobiographical planning on the one hand and visuospatial planning on the other. So these areas presented here in red um, are, are highly engaged during performance on the Tower of London task. And the areas here in blue in the default network were engaged during um, performance on the autobiographical planning condition. And, and this counting task co-varied um, with the dorsal attention network, with the Tower of London task, and in their engagement of the dorsal attention network. But the activation was not as robust. There's also a second significant component in these data. Oh, sorry, I should say that um, you should see a fairly consistent network topology between what we know to be the dorsal attention network and the default network and what we see in this task-based activation pattern. There's a second significant component in the data um, where we saw both planning tasks co-vary together and were dissociated from this counting condition. So both planning tasks are driving areas um, in the frontal poles, lateral, prefrontal cortex, the anterior insula, the anterior extent of the inferior parietal lobule, the dorsal anterior cingulate, as well as parts of the more dorsal precuneus. So these are all the regions that we talked about earlier involved in cognitive control and part of this frontal parietal control system. So just to kind of move it out of a multivariate analysis space and talk about this more generally in um, much more straightforward, simple terms, if we just take these rest and state networks and look at the bold signal in them um, across these tasks, what we find is if we look at the dorsal attention network, uh, Tower of London visual spatial planning robustly engage it. Um, autobiographical planning, you see reduction of activity in this network. The reverse is true for the default network. For autobiographical planning, there's significant increase in activity within this network and a significant decrease in activity uh, during Tower of London. Both of these planning tasks are engaging this extended frontal parietal control system. 
Now, more than just network activation, I'm also very interested in how these networks are able to communicate with each other. How, um, so in order to do this, we, we looked at was the correlation of the, of the data across the planning sequence to, as a measure of coupling between these networks. And what we find is that the dorsal tension network, so on the, on the y-axis here is that the magnitude of correlation with the frontal parietal control network. And so we're interested in how does the default network and the dorsal tension network uh, correlate with activity in this control system. So during the Tower of London task, the dorsal tension network is significantly coupled with the frontal parietal control network. And the default network is decoupled in its activation with the frontal parietal control network. So this is similar to what you see in the activation pattern, but you see a coupling of activity between dorsal tension and frontal parietal control during performance on the Tower of London task. So these perceptual systems and attention and executive systems are working together to accomplish the, to formulate these plans. During autobiographical planning, uh, we have a different pattern. The, the dorsal attention network is decoupled from the frontal parietal control system. And during autobiographical planning, the default network is highly coupled with these executive control regions. So what we have here is a task by network interaction where um, you see the frontal parietal control system being able to flexibly couple with either the default network or the dorsal attention network, uh, depending upon really the, the domain of planning. So to an extent, what we feel is that the planning content itself might be domain specific. So when you're dealing with visuospatial perceptually presented information, you're driving the dorsal attention system, but when this is autobiographical in nature, the default network activity emerges. But the process of planning itself relies upon cognitive control. And default activity can be coupled with a control network in support of goal-oriented cognition in that autobiographical domain. So when our goals are personal in nature and we're actively making personal plans, you have the default network working in concert with executive control regions. <laughs> And it seems as though this interposed control network may be able to integrate information across both attention and default networks. So trying to understand the nature of this complex network interactivity more, I think it's important to understand what is the architecture of the connections both within and between these networks. So running this study many times, we've been able to functionally localize uh, what these regions are in the brain to help characterize um, where these networks are, um, which is, it's not a trivial matter methodologically. It's hard to really know when you're dealing with pictures and images where biological places are. Um, but we feel like we've localized decently um, where these places are in the brain. And by performing some resting state functional connectivity analyses, um, have looked at the correlation among these regions of these networks. And, and what we see is, a good replication of this network topology um, where we find um, across task and then in, in resting state the regions of the control network, attention, and default network. There's high correlation within. But what I'm very interested in is the nature of these connections. How is it the attention network communicates with the control network or the default with control? And you see there is positive connectivity here and a relative absence of positive connectivity between the attention and default system. And th these, are, these are areas that are anti-correlated. They are diametrically opposed. They are, um, they're moving in opposition to each other. They're not talking to each other. So how is this dynamic balance sustained? And it seems as though it could be by virtue of the shared connectivity with this control system. Randy was talking about how you can toggle between your own thoughts and reflections and then re-attend to um, what's happening immediately around you. And this is, this is a process of executive control that can mediate um, your attention across both domains. And if we look at um, that topology using graph analysis, um, we actually see a, a fairly dense degree of interconnectivity between the default system and this control system, as well as the dorsal tension system and control. And by looking specifically at the, the interregional connectivity profile, we can actually start to formulate new hypotheses about what areas of the brain are really critical 
for, say, taking information that's retrieved from your past and bringing it to lateral prefrontal cortex so you can think about it and manipulate it um, in your thoughts. And, these, and so we're starting to have more insight into what these pathways specifically are. It actually seems like some core critical regions are por part of the, the most posterior region in middle frontal gyrus, which is at, someone say, the, the bottom of the prefrontal hierarchy of information processing. But actually, both the dorsal tension and the default network seem to converge in that part of prefrontal cortex where it can potentially move down a cascade of more elaborated processing as the goals demand at the time. There have been a number of steps to really try to understand more the nature of uh, network interactivity, both within the default network and its relationship with other, uh, other networks of the brain. Some of them with grossly oversimplified models, others um, with methodological approaches that might not actually be valid. Um, it, it's difficult to understand how information actually flows in the brain. And it's, it's extremely complicated by the slow sluggishness of the bold signal that we measure with fMRI. So I'll say I'm not entirely sure if it's possible to understand the directed flow of information. Um, on the neuronal level. We know things that move incredibly fast in the brain. Uh, Bob Knight has done some incredibly elegant work with epileptic patients with, um, whose brains are opened up and they have um, electrocardiograph on the cortex. And you have to dramatically slow down the sequence of operations to look at how somebody um, reads a word and then says the word. But it's incredibly fast. It happens um, in the millisecond range. So we know that there is very rapid propagation of information in cortex. However, we're still, with bold signal, we might be able to look at, in this lower time scale, how these brain regions are capable of interacting with each other um, on a, a different level of analysis, whether it be sort of neuronal memory or a, a long-term mode in which information is propagated in the brain and sustained in the brain. So one approach that I've been taking um, since I, I joined uh, the faculty at Cornell University, there, there's a paucity of human neuroscientists there, but there are a lot of really brilliant um, electrical engineers. And so I found myself in a conversation with Peter Dorschach one day, who is interested, and had done a lot of work looking at the replication and propagation of viruses using electron microscopy. And he was very comfortable working in a very low signal-to-noise environment. And fMRI is a very similar kind of environment. And we were talking about the nature of correlations. And he had an approach um, that relied upon an information criteria looking at um, causal linear time invariant systems where we could search the time series of data and find intervals by which activity in one region predicted the activity in the other over and above the reverse. And through this approach, we're able to actually devise non-symmetrical correlation matrices using this uh, prediction and correlation method as potentially a method for estimating effective connectivity in the brain. So what the directed flow of information is over these long time scales. What we found is that um, fairly good replication of the organization of the brain. So what we see is that we replicated the, the local uh, connectivity within this, the motor somato somatosensory regions and primary visual cortical regions, as well as the more distant connectivity um, in areas such as the default network that are depicted here in yellow and the frontal parietal control system in blue. Um, and this is fairly consistent with what we saw uh, previously um, that the Peterson group has put forward. Um, however, we actually are able to um, also estimate the flow of information within this system. So here we see the, the flow um, within default network. It's, it's, it's robust and just, it is extremely intricate and complicated. There is a lot of dense interconnectivity and the flow of information is, is moving all throughout this system. Um, however, we can also begin to estimate how information both enters the default network and exits it um, using rest and state connectivity. Now, yeah, I, if, I don't know if this is real yet, we're still, we're still performing a number of studies for validation purposes. 
What we do know is that it's, it's reliable across different subjects. Um, but it essentially, it conveys, I think, a, a great extent, the, the complexity of the problem that we're working with here in trying to understand the brain. Because these regions, they're not acting in isolation, um, and it's, their coordinated activity is really critical to understanding what's happening. So prior characterizations of these networks, and the default network in particular, suggest that the default network is very much of an isolated network. This is primarily a function of actually thresholding. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, also looking at how to threshold these matrices and examine whether or not something is actually connected or not. Um, and these approaches might actually be far too conservative in terms of estimating the denseness of the connections between regions. And in general, this is, I think, a really rich time to start to look at the off-diagonal, how these parts of the brain, we, we have a good estimation now of the brain systems of the network topology, the default network. What's important now is to really understand how it's communicating with the rest of the brain. And I've gotten the call to wrap things up, um, which is good because this is my last slide, but why is this important? Um, in, in its relationship not just to aesthetics and creativity, but just cognition and behavior in general, how is it we can take a piece of information from the world we can see something, and we can recognize it. We, it can activate a representation from our prior experiences, and it can have a resonance with us. We can recognize it as part of ourself, our prior experiences. We can contextualize that in a social setting, like how, how that meaning is shaped by our, how we communicate about it, and how we can share the experience of our interaction with the world. And then this kind of information processing might be biased towards what the default network does, but it needs to do more than that. Um, it needs to also interact with, it needs to eventually get to our motor cortex in order for us to meaningfully interact with it. And I mentioned, and we've talked about how the brain is, there's this diametric opposition between perception and the default network. However, in order to understand the world, we have to perceive the world and relate it to ourselves and the processes the default network engages in. So there needs to be a communication between the network. So the, the flow of information needs to extend beyond what is isolated and needs to be much more integrated. And the work that we're doing um, now is really to try to capture that sort of dynamism and that, that great extent of that interactivity that supports these more complex modes of cognition. So that, I, I'd like to just thank my collaborators over the last uh, years, Dan Schachter, uh, Raymond Marr, Cheryl Grady, Demis Hassabis, Jorge Sepulchra, Gary Turner, Dale Stevens, Nan Shu, and Peter Dorschach uh, doing the work on directed connectivity, as well as just Andrews Hanna. And um, we have a very recent review paper. You can see we just got the, submitted our proofs recently, um, where we cover a lot of the things I talked about today. I also have sort of a great sort of um, intellectual debt to Randy Buckner, whose work um, has been like, a great inspiration for my own uh, investigations and strivings. And thank you very much.